treat somebody like a son and call him a son and do all the things fathers do for sons, but it doesn't mean anything. We're not made of any of the same kind of thing. We're not like God. We can't act like a son of God. We don't have any divinity in us. So how do some churches solve that problem? No problem. God gives you a little bit of divinity. He makes you just a little bit godly. He gives you just a little bit of godness or divineness or divinity or something. And that's the foolishness of it, as the Quran points out to us in many ways. That you could give somebody a lot of things, but it's one thing you can't give. You can't cut it up in pieces and give away helpings of it. You can't give divinity to somebody because of what divinity is. One of the things it means when you say this person has divinity, one of the things you mean is he's always had it. Divinity is not a thing you didn't used to have, but now you have it. Divinity is not a thing you earn or achieve or you reach for and you take it, you get it, or somebody gives it. Divinity has to do with priority. Who is divine has always been divine. You can't start being divine any more than you can stop being divine because of what you mean when you say divine. This is what the Quran is talking about. It says God might adopt somebody, but it'd be an ungodly thing. It can't be done. He wouldn't be acting like God if he did it. You're trying to make somebody something that you can't make somebody. I, is that our time limit? Am I, am I taking too long with these? <laughs> uh, ruled in Spain about a thousand years ago, uh, uh, India, yes, so why have they failed to introduce their faith there? Uh, well, of course, there's lots of historians that tell you all sorts of reasons, I suppose, so you have to start to, I can only give you a few indications of part of the, if you talk about Spain, for example, the Muslims in Spain were threatened by people who would push them out. And why didn't the rest of the Muslim world come to help their brothers in Spain? They were busy doing something else at that time. You know what they were doing at that time? The Muslims in those years, instead of going to help the Muslims in Spain, they were arguing about when you make Salah, do you raise one finger or do you leave it down when you say it's Ashwood? They were busy arguing about that, too busy to go and uh, help out in Spain. Uh, so that's part of the reason. As to did they plant their faith there, uh, but they did. You see, this is a surprising thing that has come out in recent years. In recent years, things have loosened up in Spain, and uh, there's a lot of Spanish people who have been Muslims all this time. A lot of them were killed for it and so on, but for 500 years, they've managed. Now that they're not afraid, they've come out. A friend of mine who lives in the Emirates has visited there, has met them. I tell you, my family were Muslim all the time back, and we've carried it down. Or you have the situation, he met one man who said, he was a Spanish man who had accepted his land. But he told my friend, come with me, I want to show you something. He took him to his house. He says, my family has owned this house for about 800 years. Took him inside, and he showed him the carving and all the woodwork and everything. is La ilaha illallah, Muhammad Rasulullah, and so on. So he says, if I accepted Islam, it really just means I've gone back to what my ancestors had. A lot of Spanish Muslims now, uh, and a lot of them had been there all along. When they left, uh, the funny thing is that the Jews went with them, because the Jews knew they'd do better with the Muslims than to stay behind with the people who were trying to throw them out. So if this question is related to the kind of thing about do Muslims try to force things on people, it doesn't really sound likely. The Jews thought they'd, be, they'd do better with the Muslims than uh, anybody else. Um, so I hope that covers that. <laughs> but it's a, a thing that a historian could tell you better. There's some fine information that's uh, available in a, a book a brother just showed me the other day, which is probably uh, easily enough available. Um, it's written by a non-Muslim about the spread of Islam. And he documents all these kinds of things of what happened in each place, country by country. It's very interesting. last question. What is the Islamic viewpoint on the origin of man and the Darwinian theory of evolution? Uh, well, for one thing, there's all kinds of theories of evolution. The Darwinian theory, there's a neo-Darwinian and there's all sorts of theories of evolution. Uh, 
the Muslims are in a very embarrassing position in that case. Uh, I think I mentioned the other night. The Quran tells you a little bit about what man is made of and where did he come from. And most of the verses that talk about it are in, incorrectly translated into English. You know the verse that says he comes from a fluid between the backbone and the rib and all of that? It doesn't say that in the Arabic. It's something else. It tells you about where he came from. And it tells you in that place and other places, whenever it tells you a little bit about the origin of man, it tells you, the reader, that you ought to find out more about it. It says, research it. You look into it. He came from here. He's made it that. You ought to find out about it. And what happens? The Muslims haven't researched that. So that they're in a problem like with this question. They say, well, what happened? Did man evolve? Or did God roll up his big sleeves and he made him one day? Or what happened? Because he doesn't have any other alternatives. He just has the choices that other people have made that they fight about in some countries where they say, look, two choices, either man is a joke, he just happened, doesn't mean anything, or man has only been here for 6,000 years because one afternoon, or no, they'll say it was a Saturday morning, God made it. Some of you think that, it was October the 4th. <laughs> and then they say to the Muslim, which one do you believe? <laughs> you see? You're in a position of saying, well, neither one sounds very good. So you ought to look into it, like the Quran says, find out what is the origin of man. There is a book by that title, just printed last year, by Maurice Bukaya. It's called, What is the Origin of Man? And he tries to point out to the Muslims that there's a whole lot of other choices, and maybe some we haven't thought of yet, that explain about where did man come to be, that don't have anything to do with what everybody else is saying.